Good morning, everybody. I want to ask you to grab a Bible with me and open to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. John, chapter 1. Today we'll be looking at verses 35 through 51. This is what John writes. He said, The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we come now to hear from you in your word. We pray that you would cleanse our hearts, that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would clarify your voice from this scripture in our minds that you would continue to shape our desires and our will and that we would be able to see your son clearly. Amen. John the Baptist is on the scene and he is pointing people to Jesus. Verse 36, he's standing with two of his disciples, two of the disciples of John the baptizer, and he says for the second time in chapter 1, Behold, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. The title given to Jesus, which not only points to the fact that he fulfills Old Testament prophecy, but also he would fulfill the law. That Jesus was the only one who would be pure enough to be sacrificed for the forgiveness of sins. It points us to his impending slaughter that is to come in just a few short years. And hearing this, and most likely having some frame of reference in the Old Testament, the disciples of John standing around Jesus began to leave John, and then to follow Jesus. If he was the lamb, they wanted to be there to experience him, to see it, to understand 
this man. And so Jesus sees them following him physically, and he turns around and he asks him, what are you seeking? And at this point in the story, we pause because all of the words are pregnant with meaning. John is writing about a physical event that is happening. And so he's writing on one level, a historical account. And on another level, he's writing about spiritual realities that are starting to happen and that will be happening over the next number of chapters. And so we see words like these disciples followed him. And of course, in the account, it meant that they followed him down the road. (laughs) But the word disciple means learner or follower. They followed him down the road and... John is pointing us to the fact that not only would they follow him down the road, these people would eventually truly follow him with the rest of their lives. And that is what every Christian does. We see the word seeking. Jesus turns to them and asks, what are you seeking? And they replied, Rabbi, where are you staying? Of course, Jesus' question to them was not simply, what do you want? question of seeking deserves a much more serious answer. They were seeking something more profound than wanting to know where he was staying. They just didn't know they had found it yet. And so Jesus responds to their practical question about where he's staying with an answer. Come and see. He's not particularly keen on showing them where he sleeps at night. He is keen on showing them something about who he is. The invitation to come and see is something that is much greater. This invitation to come and see would serve as the reoccurring invitation throughout these next couple of accounts. They would serve as a reoccurring invitation throughout the whole Gospel of John for people that would come in contact with Jesus. The invitation to come and see serves as the reoccurring invitation for every person in the world as they seek something or someone even more profound. Now remember, the Gospel of John has an explicit purpose. John chapter 20 verse 31 tells us that these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. Jesus is the life giver. And so we see something that's happening as this life giver is now starting to walk the earth and a couple of people begin to follow him. They came They saw, and in verse 39 it says that they stayed, or they dwelled with him. At this moment, their belief is starting to happen. And it's not lost on us that as they are dwelling with Jesus, just a couple verses earlier in chapter 1, verse 14, in describing the coming of this Jesus, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Us. Indeed, he has. So much so that the disciples are now dwelling with him. When you come and see Jesus for who he really is, there's a call and even an increasing motivation to stay right there with him. And that's what they do until they can't help but think, I'm not the only one that should see him. I'm not the only one that should experience this. I'm not the only one that should dwell here. And so the account continues and we see what happens naturally when people meet Jesus. They go and tell others about him. And so in verses 41 and 42, we see that after being with Jesus, Andrew immediately goes to his brother Simon and brings him too. And in verses 43 through 46, Philip meets Jesus, and after he meets Jesus, he immediately goes and invites Nathanael to come 
and see Jesus as well. New converts to their belief in Christ tell others about Christ because they want the benefit of him for the people around them that they know and love and care about because they recognize, even after a very short time, that the person that they met was God. And he needs to be known. Friends, that's a pattern of Christian discipleship. When you come and you see Jesus for who he really is, you desire to stay and to get to know him. <laughs> and the second thing that you do is you tell others about him so they can get to know him as well. That is what Christian disciples do from the very beginning. That's part of the vision statement of Old North Church to be a Christ-centered community of disciple-making disciples. In its most simple expression, a disciple-making disciple is somebody who invites other people to come and see Jesus. Come and see what I've seen. Come and meet the one that I've met. Come and see God who has come to live among us. I wonder if you can think about the person who first introduced you to Jesus. Think about that person. And as I look across the room, I think about all of you and the hundreds of people who introduced you to this Jesus. I can't help but think of what those stories must be like. Some of them seemingly plain in your mind. Some of them seemingly incredible. Every single one of them miraculous in their nature. I wonder if you are in the habit or the pattern of being a Christian disciple, which means that you are inviting other people to come and see Jesus. Are you one of... His disciples? Are you one of the ones who has come and seen and stayed and therefore you need to go tell others as well? That's the pattern that we see from the very beginning of those who follow him. And I think there are a lot of reasons why we don't in our time today. Why don't we tell other people about Jesus? Why aren't we like Philip who tells Nathaniel or Andrew who tells Simon immediately? Well, some of us believe the lie that we can't talk about Jesus and still maintain meaningful relationships with those around us. You don't talk about politics, especially this day and age, and you don't talk about religion with people that you know if you want to stay friends with them. That's a lie. There are some cultural forces that are hostile toward Jesus. We know that to be true. But I wonder how different it actually was in Jesus' time. I mean, after all, in John chapter 1, we see the Pharisees sending some priests to question John the Baptist about whether or not he's the Messiah, and they're not asking neutrally. They're hostile toward him. We see very early on within certain ranks that early, these stages of these ministries, it's dangerous to claim that Jesus was the Messiah. But these early disciples, they just didn't even seem to care about any of that stuff. They saw him and they went and told other people because what they saw was that amazing. They didn't care about what the, the priests and the scribes would hear about. They didn't care about what their friends or neighbors would think. They saw, they were compelled, they invited others to come and to see. One of the reasons why we don't do this enough, I think, is that we think to ourselves that the invitation to come and see is easy for those in the first century who lived when Jesus walked the earth. They could actually say, come and see him in the flesh, physically. But what are you inviting them to come and actually see if you're inviting somebody today? We walk by faith, not by sight. We just sang about that a minute ago. So what are you inviting them to come and see? 
Well, maybe you could say it this way. That when you invite someone to come and to see Jesus, you are inviting them to come and experience the Lord as you've experienced him. Because even though we walk by faith and not by sight, you can still experience Jesus every single day of your life. And so that looks different in a number of different ways, doesn't it? You could invite someone to come and see Jesus by asking them if they would read the Bible with you. You can invite somebody to come and see Jesus by having ongoing conversations about the most important things of life and death and eternity and pointing them to the Lamb of God. You could invite someone to come and see Jesus by inviting them to join you in your small group or your Sunday school class or here in church on Sunday. And we know that inviting people to see Jesus is not just inviting people to church, but let's not downplay the fact that we gather together to worship and to know and to see Jesus more clearly even as we are here as the church every given week. A couple years ago, LifeWay Research conducted a survey of 15,000 adults in North America to try to determine their receptivity to invitations. And this is what they found. And I hope this encourages you. That 67% of Americans say that a personal invitation from a family member would be very effective or somewhat effective in getting them to visit a church. 67%. 63% said that a friend or a neighbor inviting them would be very effective or somewhat effective in getting them to visit a church, to come and see. That's not a small number. That's not representative of the hostile disposition toward Jesus that you read about or that you hear about. Likewise, 63% of Americans are very or somewhat willing to receive information uh, about a local church or faith community from a family member, 56 from a friend or from a neighbor. Again, people are open. They are seeking something. And it just sounds like the disciples need to be willing to give the invitation. As hostile as the culture is portrayed in our media, on the ground, people are open to the invitation to come and see Jesus. Friends, there are 269,000 households in this region or this media market of Northeast Ohio, Western Pennsylvania. Will you invite somebody to come and see him? Even this week, invite them to read the Bible with you. Invite them to read a book with you. Invite them to your small group. Invite them to here, to church on Sunday. Invite them whatever way you can. Invite them to come and see Jesus. This is what disciples do. Now we see as the text continues that Philip invites Nathaniel to come and see this one that the was written about in the Old Testament, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael's immediate response, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael prejudged the man based on where he was from. He prejudged him. He had prejudice against him based on his perception. Now we could say a lot about the value judgments that we place on people and places and activities based on our perceptions. We all carry varying degrees of prejudices. And what this prejudice shows from Nathaniel was that he was interested to see the Messiah, but only on certain conditions. And this is all too relatable for us. Because so many of us are reluctant to get too close until our conditions are met. We 
want God, we want the things of God, we want the blessings of God, we certainly want the eternal future that God offers, but we're unwilling to get close to the Messiah until our conditions are met. We're prejudiced against him. And so what kind of conditions do you set on him before you're willing to draw near, before you're willing to come and see Some of us say, well, if he gives me emotional happiness, if and only if he takes me out of my downtrodden state and gives me happiness, then I will draw near. Some of us say, I'll consider drawing near, but he has to let me continue to do those things I want to do. He has to let me continue to have the habits and patterns of life I enjoy, even if he doesn't like them so much. He has to let me to continue to sleep around or to drink too much or to gossip or to whatever it might be. And if he lets me do those things, then I'll draw near and see him. Some of us have conditions like this. My condition for drawing near and really exploring who this guy is more closely is as long as it doesn't cost me anything financially, please don't ask me for money. Or if my kids aren't robbed of any worldly opportunities that they have, then maybe we'll draw near and follow him. Or if he doesn't demand too much of me in my time, if I can fit him into my box, if I can tack him on to my life, if I can have my life plus a little bit of Jesus on the side, then I will draw near. These are all the types of conditions that we tend to put on drawing near to him. But what one soon finds out is that in those conditions, if you have them, they will rob you of an honest inquiry of the Son of God. But conversely, honest investigation is the cure for prejudice. Honest investigation without conditions is the cure for prejudice. Nathaniel doesn't have his conditions met before he meets Jesus. He has to take a few steps down the path first. He has to come and see him for himself. So many of us hold to Jesus at an arm's length We are waiting for the checklist of our requirements to be completed before we decide to go all in with honest inquiry of him. But if you are waiting for those conditions to be met, you will never see him for who he really is. If you are ensconced in whatever the prejudgment that you've made is, you're never going to see him for who he really is. Nathaniel was coming. His conditions were not met. Jesus wasn't from a certain town or from a certain uh, status that he might have liked. He came with conditions, but he left having seen the Savior. And you can too. But you have to honestly investigate him. And so listen to what Nathaniel experienced. Nathanael comes, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Jesus replies, as he's walking near, behold, there's an Israelite in whom is no deceit. His blunt and honest assessment and the heart behind it was known by Jesus. To say that this was an Israelite who had no deceit or no guile, some of your translations might say, is a way to say that Nathaniel was a lot of things, but he wasn't (laughs) two-faced. He wasn't a hypocrite. People who are hypocrites never do well with Jesus. (laughs) And even though he comes with some wrong assumptions, at least he's honest about what he thinks and is honestly coming to see him. And as he does, he's shown grace. And more importantly, you see what happens here, right? That Jesus sees what is happening with Nathanael on the inside. He sees his heart. He knows him already. 
Jesus knows Nathanael even before Nathanael knows Jesus. Jesus knows you (laughs) even before you knew him. And he shows Nathanael a glimpse of who he is so that he can believe. But not only does Jesus know what is happening on the inside, he also sees what's happening on the outside, even from a great distance. Jesus says to Nathanael after he says, well, how do you know me? He says, before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. He knows what's happening on the inside. He knows what's happening on the outside. And immediately upon realizing this, Nathanael bursts out in recognition of who he is. You are the son of God. You have to be. You are the king of Israel. Friends, Jesus knows us inside and out. This is what it means to be the light that comes into the darkness and shines He knew us before we knew him, which makes it all the more amazing that he still invites us to come and to see him. At this point in the story, it's probably worth mentioning something that I'm sure you've noticed already. Is that as these four have come to Jesus, they all call him something different. Did you notice that? One calls him rabbi, one calls him him who Moses wrote about, one calls him the son of God and the king of Israel. They're all calling him something different. And then Jesus calls himself something different. In fact, when you look at John chapter 1, again, the writer is writing on multiple levels. He's describing what's happening in real time, and he is setting up what's going to happen so we can see him more clearly. There's 11 titles and names for Jesus in the first chapter of John that I can count. 11. And it's important to recognize each name or title because it not only reveals what Jesus does, but it points to his character, his essence. Names have meaning in the ancient world. It points to character or the essence of somebody. And so we're not going to spend time examining each one, but I want to list them for you so you can go back and read them on your own and think about them. In John chapter 1, 1, we see Jesus called the Word. We see him called God. The Word was with God. The Word was God. In verse 5, Jesus was called the Light. In verse 7, he's called Christ. Or verse 17, he's called Christ. In verse 29, he's called the Lamb of God. In verse 34, he's called the Son of God. In verse 38, he's called rabbi. In verse 41, he's called Messiah. In verse 45, he's called him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. In verse 49, he's called the king of Israel. And in verse 51, Jesus calls himself the son of man. And it's interesting to note on the side that that title, the son of man, is a title that Jesus calls himself more than any other title in the Gospels. Jesus is given a bunch of titles. He's given a bunch of names. He fulfills a bunch of titles and fulfills a bunch of names, but he keeps calling himself the Son of Man, and nobody else calls him that. I think 80 times he calls himself the Son of Man, and once outside of the Gospels, somebody else calls him the Son of Man in Acts chapter 7. To say that Jesus is the son of man is to probably give him the most humble of titles. To emphasize the fact that he is here. He's dwelling among the people of the earth. And he gives an invitation to come and to see. Come and see. (laughs) Tell others to come and see. (laughs) And then he concludes with Nathaniel by saying that you have seen something, but you're going to see something even greater than this. Look with me at verses 50 and 51. Jesus answers Nathaniel, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? 
you will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you that you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. It's an interesting picture, isn't it? Jesus basically functioning as a ladder with angels going up and down the ladder. What does that mean? Well, it has no explanation in the passage, does it? Jesus says, you're going to see greater things, and this is what you're going to see. But I'm not really going to tell you what it means. (laughs) What could it mean? I'm sure for some of us, this image calls to mind another image in the Old Testament. Are you picturing it? For four new disciples who are all Jewish, they might picture it. It's a very similar image to the dream that Jacob has in Genesis chapter 28. Do you remember that dream? Let me read it for you. In Genesis chapter 28, Jacob comes to a certain place in verse 11 it says and he stayed there that night because the sun had set and taking one of the stones of the place he put it under his head and he lay down in that place to sleep and he dreamed and behold there was a ladder set up on the earth and at the top of it reached to heaven and behold the angels of God were ascending and descending on it And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you and then Jacob awoke from his sleep and he said surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it and he was afraid and he said how awesome is this place this is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of heaven Jacob has a dream, there's a ladder, there's angels that are going up and down the ladder between heaven and earth. God is at top of the ladder in heaven. He doesn't explain why the ladder's there, why the angels are going up and down. He simply gives his promise of his presence and his blessing to Jacob. And Jacob names the place Bethel, which means the house of God. John chapter 1, Jesus gives an image, a ladder, he's the ladder, angels are going up and down the ladder, there's no explanation of what the angels are doing or why they're there. What could it mean? I think it could mean at least two things and probably more. Number one, the connection is obvious. Whereas there is a ladder between heaven and earth in the Old Testament, Jesus is the bridge or the ladder between earth and heaven now. If you want to experience the God of heaven in heaven, there is one ladder to get there. Jesus. And he is there in the flesh and he's inviting them to come. What else can it mean? I think secondly it means that there is a place where you experience God. Jacob says, God is in this place, and so I'm going to name it the house of God, (laughs) Bethel. But now there is a place where you can experience God, but it's not a physical place. It's not a person. It is a person. That in following God today, there's not a holy site that you need to go to to be faithful. You do not need to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem as interesting as that could be. You do not need to go to the temple where God lives. You don't 
even need to come to this church building to meet God. There's one place that you meet God, in the person of Jesus. He is where God is accessed and where God will be accessed for eternity. Come and see Jesus and you will see God. Come and see Jesus and you will see the plan of God. Oh, friends, how I long for those of you who are sitting on the fringe with arms linked to Jesus because of your conditions to come to him and investigate him honestly and purely. You want to get close to him, but you don't want to give up the things that you hold so dear. And my friends, when you meet him, you will want to give those things up. You will want to stay. Friends, how I long for this church to be a place where people are so enraptured with the rabbi, the son of God, the light who is in the darkness, the king of Israel, the Christ, that the first thing that they want to do when they get up in the morning is to say, I need to tell somebody else about this so they can come and see too because he is amazing. How I long for us to live like that. You know, the most famous ship of all time. You know what it is, the Titanic. Supposedly the unsinkable ship. It went down on its maiden voyage, and many movies have been made, many books have been written about the fateful journey, and very few will include the story of the Scottish evangelist, John Harper. John Harper was a passenger on the Titanic. And in 1912, he was traveling from Scotland to Chicago to take up his appointment as the pastor of the Moody Church. He and his daughter, Nana, were on board. His wife had passed away a few years earlier. And when the Titanic struck the iceberg and began to sink, he put Nana into a lifeboat and then he ran throughout the ship yelling, women, children, and unsaved into the lifeboats. When the ship finally went down, he had already given away his life jacket to another passenger. Survivors report to the very end, Harper was witnessing to anyone and everyone who would listen to him. One survivor recalls clinging to one of the ship's spars when Harper floated near him and said, Man, are you saved? No, I'm not, replied the man. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved pleaded Harper, and the waves carried him away. And they brought him back (laughs) a little while later. Are you saved now? asked Harper. No, I can honestly say that I'm not, says the man. And again, Harper pleaded with him with his dying breath, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And shortly afterward, Harper went down to the bottom. The man who survived was one of only six people rescued, but in the public meeting four years later, recounting this episode, he said, there alone in the night and with two miles of water under me, I believed. I am John Harper's last convert. Come to Jesus and see. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the invitation that you give to us. That you see us before we see you, that you know us before we know you. And I pray that this invitation would stir in our hearts and our minds for those here who have not yet come to see him that they would come even today and for those who have to extend this invitation to another we pray because Jesus is that magnificent amen